I would not want to be accused of ever uh, starting er early, let alone uh, on, on time. But it, it, it is 9.59. Uh, so uh, let's uh, start. So you are in the right place if this looks familiar. I always start my presentations out with a description of the session that you're hopefully hoping to attend. Um, I have been known to start conversations with people uh, and get quite far into them uh, before we realized that we were both in the wrong place. Uh, so that hopefully that is not the case. Well, we are not gonna go through this laundry list uh, of items one by one, but rather from uh, a higher level at first, and I think, hey Alex, what, what will be a more practical, applicable level uh, later on. I realized also, when starting to really put this presentation to, together, this was a very ambitious list we put together. <laughs> So, um, uh, probably a little bit more that we, that we can go through in just half an hour, but damn it, we're going to try. <laughs> so, um, uh, this is us, um, and if we haven't met you be before, we're very pleased. Uh, I will be um, leaving this session faster than you can throw a tomato because I will be driving across country uh, to bring my daughter to LA, but I have to go back to Long Island before I can actually start that. So I'm damned no matter what. <laughs> so um, there are dams and there are dams, okay? But strangely enough, many of the concepts are the same. Beavers work extremely hard to create very sophisticated dams. They're very sophisticated if you're a beaver, and they're pretty impressive, even if you're not a beaver. And we all know they, well, we don't all know, I had to remind myself, that the reason why they build dams is to protect themselves from predators, right? To limit risk, to create safety, and a nice, comfortable home from which they can do all sorts of wonderful beaver-like things. Human beings create dams that are very complicated, okay, that limit risk, maybe sometimes even create risk, but enable them to do things like, I don't know, power generation, all right, important things. Um, perhaps even environmentally controversial things. But nevertheless, we will be talking about a different kind of dam. A dam that will not necessarily hold water, but will hopefully hold all our different assets of many different kinds. Simple, right? No. In fact, there are quite a few things that we want dams to do, and we have some expectations about how they will be done. We want to be able to take a situation where an asset has been created. Let's not even worry about how it's created just yet. And what we then want to be able to do is ingest, let's say register, that information into a system. And going through my research on this presentation, someone said dams were the poor cousin to CMSs. Maybe they do do a lot of the same things. What we do for content, we often think about assets as content, they do much more narrowly or in a more focused manner for specific types of assets. So if anybody's been in the Drupal community uh, as long or longer than I am, um, you did what you would have done when you worked uh, with basic, a basic um, 
uh, web pages, and you FTP'd your images up to a directory in your site. And maybe when you first started using Drupal, you were smarter than me, or maybe, like me, you wondered, oh, how easy that was to get all those images up to the new site. It's just like the old way. But wait a second, what makes it a CMS? So the same thing that made Drupal a CMS is what needs to make your dam functional, right? And that implies understanding your asset not as a flat file, but as something that has rich uh, data, that has metadata attached to it. So this activity of registering it actually involves a lot of work. It's not just as simple as, oh, let's buy this dam, bolt it onto Drupal or any other package, and we can start using it, right? All of a sudden you begin to realize, oh, getting the best out of my dam is going to require some preparation on my part, just like getting the most out of Drupal or your CMS requires a whole heck of a lot of preparation. And, and so on and so forth, as you go forward and curate, distribute, reuse, and archive information in your dam, the technology is just that, right? You still need to perform a lot of manual tasks. Now, there is perhaps an exception to that, or that may be a paradigm that is about to become obsolete. Anyone care to hazard a guess as to what might change that paradigm? AI. AI. And so how many sessions have we had on AI today? <laughs> Probably a lot fewer than we will have next year. And so on and so forth. So AI is something that is heavily impacting the dam e uh, market segment. And as Mandy and I discussed yesterday uh, during a training, full day, oh my God, you're back for more. Thank you very much for all of you that are returning for re repeat business. Um, the way you structure your data and your content is key um, in dams as well. So, moving on, you're understanding all these different use cases, or excuse me, workflows, right, and that dams are being asked to manage. And you might be saying, hmm, I've used Drupal for some of this. I can use Drupal for some of this. You absolutely can. It was only about 10 years ago that we created a very large digital asset management for a very large pharmaceutical um, organization that was very close by uh, to Princeton. And, it, and it's been quite a few years since they have stopped using uh, that dam because there's so many other alternatives in the market. Um, but we built it, of course, using Drupal. So, um, the dam space, first of all, how many folks have dams operable? Two? Three? What was that, Alex? What's that mean? Kind of, sort of? But we're an agency, not a large organization. But you use it in, in, internally as an agency. Brilliant, that counts. Okay, so three out of quite a few more people here. I wonder why that is. Do you... Uh, you collectively in this room, let's see hands. Do you not need a dam? Who here is, I mean, I know you're all interested in dams. Who really wants a dam? Okay. How many people are, are, think that there might be some impediments to their getting a dam? Okay, so we're gonna actually talk about these things, mind you, in the time allotted. Um, so, um, there are some, some damn leaders, and there are more leaders in this segment, okay? 
But there are some that stand out. One of them probably in particular will stand out to you because um, we as a community have benefited from many of the contributions that individuals and the organization ha has made. And that is, of course, Acquia that purchased a Widen and made it Acquia Dam, right? And for many of us, we're thinking, oh, that's a go-to solution. There are also a few modules related to dams, purpose, well, I don't know, purposeful, but tagged as being compatible with Drupal 10. Is this a lot of modules for f folks that have been around in the Drupal community? Anybody hazard to offer an opinion? I know I have one. Is this a lot of modules? Yes. There were. Yes? I think so. For one particular? For one particular? I'm going to hazard to say, and Brian, and I respect your op opinion, that it's not, right? Because I don't know how many of these are functional. Right. I, I know they're all tagged with Drupal 10, but not so sure. I don't know how many are helper modules. There were 32 damn modules tagged with the Drupal taxonomy, right, uh, in the contrib space. I par parsed them down to um, 20 and then parsed that list down because like Aqua had three or four of them, right? So I'm gonna hazard to say that the integration of Aquia and VAMS has been fraught. Anyone wanna disagree? Anyone have experience to validate that statement? Oh, well, that's a good thing. David, I see David. I will at least say they all have different names. <laughs> <laughs> like at least a, 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 a separator in your world. You know, you don't have like fourteen of them that basically just say blah blah damn, and you're like, which one am I using? I don't even remember. I think seeing that list, it'd be hard to if you know nothing about dams. Where do you even begin? There you so, go. There's so many different companies and options there. And like you said, you'd have to spend a lot of time vetting each of those modules to see how complex and the trick are. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I don't necessarily agree, because I think where you're going to start is the dam. You're going to start at the product, not the module, because right? these are integrators. That's true. So you're going to figure out which one it is that you want. Mm -hmm. You're going to like figure out if it's the right use case, if you get a contract for it, then you're going to go to Drupal and determine does NextCloud have an integration module. And thank God there are 14 next cloud integration modules. <laughs> so what I'm hearing is there's a whole lot of dam complexity, right? So you've got the dam, you've got the CMS, and maybe you've actually got a project management suite like Workfront, like Jira, or any number of other things that you manage the creation of your assets with. If anybody works with organizations that have their own creative teams or perhaps have their own creative teams as, as well. In researching this, there were some diagrams that had five or six points along the, the damn workflow and some that had 11. I'm like, hmm, what were the ones that had 11? They're the ones that incorporate the management of the creation or procurement of those assets. And why is that important? Well, it might not be for your organization, but for some organizations that are asset intensive, it is extremely important to have those tightly coupled. But let's take a look out the world outside of Drupal. Let's get off our damn island and kind of take a look at how other folks are thinking about dams. Well, this information from Forrester dates back to 2022, I think spring of 2022. It's now two years later. Some things have happened since then in this space. This kind of made me think that maybe combined with 
are that combined with um, wow um, that that is the road trip calling so uh, it made me think that the complexity and and flexibility of a platform like Drupal might introduce a lot of other questions that other platforms that these folks might also be using don't necessarily have. They might be using damn systems that make more assumptions about how their, their assets are going to be used than the typical architect or manager of a Drupal platform would like because typically we use Drupal because it makes certain base assumptions and gives us the flexibility to create bespoke systems for our organizations and our clients. So it seemed to me that there was some friction heating up. And knowing what kind of experience we have had as an organization at FFW developing these types of platforms, it resonated for me. So, now we know all these, well, we know some of these complexities around dams. So why should we give a dam? Well, dams have become, in many ways, inevitable. And there are certain forces, market forces, that are pushing us in that direction similar to the market forces that pushed us in the direction of CMSs. How many one-page sites are there out there nowadays? That was a big thing a few years ago. Less so. Headless, a big thing that's slowly gaining traction. Certainly gaining traction outside the Drupal community, but making slow, steady progress within the Drupal community. And I think, I believe, that there's this a same type of pressures that have impacted the DXP space, or the CMS space specifically, the same type of pressures are at work in the dam space. And these changes have to deal, I think, with these three trends, which just happen to correlate to the ones I read in Forrester uh, while doing research for this, and the next time I'm actually going to put the attribution, but it's been recorded. So AI, huge, all right? One of those top 10 providers has a brilliant AI function that can read and listen to videos and create um, benchmark testing based upon the videos. It can listen for the question that was prompt, the subject matter that was conveyed, and create an answer set and generate test questions from it for application and learning management systems. So AI is shaking up the space hugely. Content growth. I, I mean, my wife grew up in, in London. She always reminds me they had three channels. I grew up in New York. We had three main channels and a couple others, and then there are all the ones you couldn't on UHF. I know, I'm dating myself, right? <laughs> then Bruce Springsteen wrote a song about how many cable channels there, there were. I think it's grown exponentially since then. In the digital space, there's no counting the number of channels. This is an incredible pressure that's being placed on organizations and agencies to manage assets across channels. And then finally, we have become such a visual culture. And we don't need to read something God forbid, Murphy forbid, if we actually read something, okay? Instead, we see things, and we recognize things, and we recognize patterns, and we recognize dissonance, which is what we get 
when our assets don't conform to our brand styles. So you should give a damn about the inevitable. But you should also give a damn because some of the stuff we're talking about is pretty cool, right? It makes all these things possible. So, okay, I'm gonna accept that everybody in this room is convinced that they wanna be damned. <laughs> Are you ready to be damned? I will posit that you will not know you're ready until you execute a proof of concept for your agency or your organization. What is that proof of concept going to consist of? Well, it begins with ideation. It begins with questions you probably have already begun to ask yourself. What specifically is this going to do for me? How specifically is this new platform that has to be integrated with my existing platform going to function? We have questions, we want answers. This just happens to be a list of blue sky questions that came off a project that David Hernandez worked on. And what did they do with these questions? They created a proof of concept, an engagement with an organization that began with a discovery Notice the last thing on this list is choosing the technology. Because we all live in a world where we get sold to. And most of the time, we're working with folks that really want to match what they have with what we need. But as a pre-sales director, there's a lot of room for miscommunication and, and disconnection in that process. And we put together scopes of work that are really awesome. And then we put together change orders that are really awesome too. And all that is extra drag. And I would posit that of the many things that we have done in Drupal together that we will do in the future. Working with a, a, a damn integration or a damn platform is going to be one of the most damn complex things that we can <coughs> manage. We've migrated thousands and thousands of sites. We've built hundreds and thousands of, of sites collectively. I don't know. How, what kind of body of work do we have as a community around dam integration? Now, this POC project chose as the technology to work from Aquia Dam, Widen. The effort is a couple of, is a year plus old. Things have changed. We spent a long time waiting for things to happen. At the end of it, we still had some questions. But we were much better positioned to make good choices. Once you go through a damn discovery, you can do the damn POC. And you should define it. And you should define it properly. You should put clear limits on it. You could use this as a scope of work for your next project, whether or not you're working with a vendor or internally. I could do a whole nother workshop on how to select a dam based upon 
features, maturity, readiness, cost, expandability, portability, accessibility, feasibility, yada, yada. But you're going to do all this so that you can actually have a really robust implementation of course. You're going to do all this because you might want to pivot. David. You know, say going back to the first slide, you know, just emphasizing the building of requirements first before making your selection is, is probably, as Ray's saying, <coughs> most important here than with like almost any other technology I've worked with because all of the vendors that you're going to work with will be slightly different and your requirements for how you want your asset manager to work can often be extremely detailed especially when you're dealing with marketing people for like how they want it to work and what they want the website to do with it like particularly images and if you are not incredibly detailed and figure out exactly what the requirements are, you are going to find out that when you start to use it, it's not going to meet one of those requirements and you don't realize it. Um, and that's going to be extremely painful. Um, so I would encourage you to make sure, like fully, like if you're dealing with a, a website, like just images are the most complicated part of this. Right, if you're just dealing with like PDFs, Word documents, it doesn't matter, you're just gonna get like a link to the file or something like that. Images are really the pain point. And you have to deal with things like how does it handle image styling, what versions of images it returns, does it have the ability to do like focal point and cropping and like all kinds of modifications and things like that will return the, the image that way or do you have to modify it? It's, it's, it's definitely the most complicated part of it. And if you're not like really clear in what kind of requirements you have for what you're going to do with those images or what you want to do with those images, You'll get to the point where like you might get too far in and then realize your your dam won't support a certain thing. Or like you have to completely rechange the way your site functions in order to get that particular requirement. And that's really painful. So I would encourage you to like figure out what that is, but then also test it. You really, really, really need to test it. Because these are vendors and they're liars. So they will tell you that they do certain things, and then when you're going to try it, that doesn't do the thing that they say that it does, or it doesn't do it in a way that you can stand with their Well, I'm done ranting now. So you said earlier. <laughs> but yeah, so make sure you figure that out first. Well, and to to build on uh, what David was saying, which in case people uh, listening to the recording in the future didn't hear it, it was brilliant. Um, <laughs> so if you take requirement gathering and requirement management and see it as just that inside your dam it begs the question do you have functionality for traceability do you have functionality for governance do you have functionality for change management so how did this change in this asset come about? Who requested it? Who executed it? When we change this asset in these specific dimensions, what other requirements is it going to affect or what other displays is it going to break? Do we have um, version con control? Can we revert? on specific cha changes, what type of granularity. So now you're talking about a requirements management system inside your dam, or you're talking about a requirements management system inside your project management system, or you're talking about, oh, maybe we should get a requirements management system. Any other? Questions, discussion points? So of course, your POC should include an aspect of migration, right? So your 
your go what what we um, urge is that folks identify exemplars of assets and outliers. And then during the POC, take a sample group so that when you get to the migration, you can script as much of it as possible. We recommend you don't get caught by the devil in the details. And you play, pay careful attention to missing attributes, manually validating assets, and updating your CMS location so it knows where to find that asset. Now, you've invested a lot of time and effort into vetting one particular platform or maybe even more. What happens if you find that uh, this is not turning out like we had hoped? Well, we're going to recommend that you don't throw caution to the wind, that you actually go back to familiar territory. So there's a lot of hype about dams I've just hyped you up a whole lot about dams in this session. But you will recall that I began with, we built a very big dam 10 years ago in Drupal for a very large organization. And even though they are not using it today, they used it for a very long time. So a big part of negotiating dams is understanding when it's right for you and how ready you are to actually use it. It doesn't happen so often, but I know when I was starting out, I would build these beautiful Drupal 5, even 4.7 systems for folks, and they were thrilled. And then nothing changed on the, on the site for six months or a year. I'm like, why did we build a content management system? And they're like, well, we really don't have anybody to change the content. How many times have you been a part of a project where you've gotten a subscription and it's just laid dormant for years or for a while. You can make a whole lot of more headway around the base readiness for a, a, an asset management, not damn, an asset management feature set. You can build your readiness and your capacity by staying in Drupal and working on it. You can also consider using Drupal less, winding it back a little bit, and having some of these platforms take on some of the functionality. Not an easy proposition for folks that have mature, robust operations. But you have to be willing to use the proof of concept to pivot if you need to. If the proof of concept goes well, I invite you to just do it. I, I, I held back and didn't put the Rocky Horror Picture Show clip in this presentation. If we had more time, in the meantime, I'm so glad we've had this damn time together. Questions, comments, thoughts, other discussion among, among the group? We have 10 whole minutes.
Jill. Jill. Right, question. Please. How, how do you describe the difference between a dam and just a website owner that might have 15 websites that wants to put the same picture on all of them? Is, is there a difference? The, uh, Repeat the question. How uh, would you tell the difference in the need for whether or not uh, an organization that may have 15 websites but just wants to duplicate the same picture, the same header, the same asset across each of those 15 sites? Well, I have some thoughts or opinions. How about the rest of the group? Okay, I'll go first. <laughs> so, we. For me, it's very helpful that we think about dams in many of the same ways that we think about content management systems. So 15 organizations, 100 images across 15 images. Now what happens when one of them needs to change and there's an exception to the rule? Not that big a deal. We've got teams, we know how to do this. We can make the change, we can make the exception, and we can log it. Now what happens when the organization finds out Monday morning that the chair and the board were out golfing on Sunday afternoon and they decided to do X, Y changes and they need to be made by Monday afternoon, but they only need to be made for a certain number of folks. So it's the chaos and the unforeseen and unanticipated issues that you have to balance. And the word I use for it is volatility. Right? If you know that something's going to be stable most of the time, but there's, there's going to be a silly season when everybody's out playing golf and making changes, you can prepare for that. And you can actually put in place the governance policies and the procedures to track it. And then when the silly season is over, you can deal with it. And you don't have to deal with all the overhead. right? And we do that sort of thing all the time. But now if you take that and you say, OK, there's going to be a silly season, but now we're not just talking about the web channel anymore. We're talking about social. We're talking about signage. We're talking about marketing or automation. So the more channels you get, the more complexity that's introduced, even though you effectively have low demand, right? Because it's only 15 sites and most of the time everything is this, the change, your volatility will go up. Because on, at each channel, you have a set of requirements that you are trying to match, okay? Facebook wants these dimensions. LinkedIn wants those dimensions. Your dam can help you with that. Yes? Um, I'm just wondering, uh, do you have any suggestions for managing dams with the third-party video providers? Like if you're using YouTube or Vimeo, you've still got you know, metadata, thumbnail images, stuff like that. Any uh, pointers on that type of use case? There are. There are dams that are more well suited to managing video. Repeat the question. The question was, <laughs> thank you. Um, do we have any thoughts or recommendations around how dams interact with video intensive use cases? Is that fair? Yeah, and third party providers. Third party in particular, yeah. acro across third party in particular. Um, David, any experience? Anyone else that wants yeah, to bring so it to bear? The, the problem is going to be how you're implementing the video. Um, so there's. Come on, come on. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> See, interjecting just wears off. <laughs> okay. So you're going to have to deal with an integration for the video itself, uh, which at times is really straightforward. Like if you're just dealing with YouTube or something, you can just deal with the integration to YouTube and then you can just display YouTube's player. 
But then if you need to actually do something that's more complicated than that, um, managing the YouTube player, like on the front end, is a lot more complicated and difficult and often won't work correctly, depending on what it is you're trying to do. So then you're going to want something that's more like a local file. And then that becomes something where like, oh, it'd be great if we had just have like MP4s that are in the DAM and then we could pull the MP4 in. Because if you want to then try to do something like, um, and I actually just did this a couple of weeks ago, like try to make a YouTube video be the background image for like a hero or something. Like that doesn't work very well because it's hard to like manage the size of the player and its aspect ratio. But if you have a local MP4 that's just like in a video tag, it's easy, you just treat it like an image. Um, so you, you have to really pay attention to that use case. Uh, but then that means you might have to serve the file, right? So you have to pay attention to like how big is the file, where you're putting it, so if it's in the dam, what's, you know, what's happening with it. Uh, but then if you're using a dam, hopefully then like that's basically acting like a CDN and it's serving the file for you so you don't have to worry about that kind of stuff. Uh, but so, you know, it really does come down to the use case. If you're then just sticking a video that's like in the middle of a blog post or something, then like, yeah, use Vimeo, use YouTube, whatever. It's like, it's totally fine. Um, so there is this consideration that you have to have for, are you treating things like you're just integrating them or are you treating things like they're local? Um, and it's, it's kind of the same thing with the images, right? It's like, there's a lot of stuff you can do in Drupal for image handling or like the image styles and the effects that you do on the images themselves. But you can really only do that if the files are local. Uh, if you're just gonna pull them from your CDN essentially, like you are very limited in the kind of things you can do to the image or even anything, right? So like how would you do focal point if you're pulling an image that you're just linking to remotely? Like that's not a thing you can really do easily unless the system supports it. So you'd have to pull the image in directly and like make it like a Drupal file that's like local. Um, some of the connectors do that, like the Acquia Dam one will do that for you, but then like you're losing all of the advantages of treating your dam like a CDN and serving the files for you and all this sort of stuff. So that's like you gotta figure these things out ahead of time. And you can do both, right? So I have some systems where like somebody can just choose a YouTube video and it just does the YouTube player, or they can choose a local file and then it like embeds the video tag so you can use it from the hero image, stuff like that. And, you know, you can do it both ways. Again, always test the thing that you want to do because this is like the most complicated technology to integrate. Like they, they all are just like very, very particular. I like just had to like program a loop function for a YouTube video because YouTube's loop function kind of sucks and doesn't work well. And then like, they're like, why did it flash for like a nanosecond? And then I had to like write all kinds of custom code to fix that. It's really annoying. Alex. When uh, doing proof of concepts, do you find that most of the teams you're working with are coming from just using a Google Drive folder or equivalent, uh, Drupal custom modules or some, some other jam solution? What are you seeing as the type of context? Que the question is, what are we seeing, what type of context are we seeing among folks that are interested in, in dams? Um, two minutes. And, and we'll be quick. So I'm, I'm glad you asked that brilliant question, Alex, because what we have experienced is a lot of misunderstanding between exploration and experimentation and a proof of concept. They are different. So we have seen a lot of people, a lot of organizations that have been fiddling with damn functionality for a long time and that's awesome and that's one of the reasons why they're curious about dams because they are slowly getting to know more and more about it but and as imperative as experimentation and exploration is it is different from a proof of concept the premise behind a POC says we need something to go into production and flatten our workflows and optimize our, our abilities. It has to do a specific set of things upon launch 
we need to know that it can do another specific set of things X period from launch before I spend six figures times whatever we need to know that this can work because this is a really complex proposition that doesn't have a tremendous body of work out there that we can survey on our particular platform. So we get a lot of folks that are really enthusiastic and think they've learned a lot, and they have, and they should be, and we don't want them to be disappointed, to set them back, and it's the importance of def carefully defining a proof of concept and carefully looking at the return on investment over a period of time because you don't have to do anything forever. The, the, the dam, dam we built in Drupal, it's good that it's not operational today, right? But they got a return on their investment. So define a period of time that you have to get the return on your investment. Make a smart investment and prepare for the next level. I think I'm at time. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you for indulging us. Thank you.